The first part of Lecture 4 involves electromagnetic radiation. We're going to be using electromagnetic radiation to study the atom. Before Rutherford came along in 1911, there was a previous model of the atom called the plum pudding model of the atom, where the electrons were like the raisins in plum pudding, the negative charge spread out among the positively charged circle of the atom, just like raisins in plum pudding. But of course science advances, and we move to the Rutherford model of the atom where the electrons were outside and the nucleus contained the protons and the neutrons, and much of the atom had empty space. But we can go further with this development. So the question is, how do you study something that you can't look inside of? Number one, the atom is extremely small. And number two, there's a lot of energy involved in the atom, as we know from various weapons and nuclear power. So how do you study something that you can't really look inside of? Well, I'm from the Midwest, and I am quite familiar with tornadoes. So how do you study something that's very powerful and that you can't look inside of it? Well, if you remember the movie Twister, you throw a probe at it and you see what comes out. So that's what our electromagnetic radiation is. It's a probe of the atom. Now, first off, when people talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, often they just say light. Visible light is actually a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It can range anywhere from radio waves to gamma rays. And this scale right here sort of shows you the different types of wavelength regions that are available in the electromagnetic spectrum. We'll start with low energy waves like radio waves, AM and FM radio. These are low energy and they have a long wavelength. Microwaves have a bit more energy and you notice the wavelength is getting smaller. Infrared have still more energy, followed by visible light, which is the range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see in. In increasing energy is then ultraviolet light, followed by x rays followed by gamma rays. And you notice from this diagram here, a large distance between the waves is low energy. A short distance between the waves is high energy. So just to give you a brief history, radio waves are typically measured in hertz, which I'll explain are cycles per second, and the wavelengths of these are as long as football fields. Microwaves are efficiently absorbed by water, so they're used for both cooking and medical imaging. Perhaps you've heard of an MRI. Infrared waves are also called heat signatures, and these can be used in commercial night vision equipment and to keep food warm. Visible are the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum seen by human and most animal eyes. Ultraviolet waves are high in energy. These can break chemical bonds, which might explain sunburn to you. X-rays, these are very high energy. We can use them to see through the body to bones. So they have multiple medical uses, but they are, of course, high in energy. Gamma rays, these are the most energetic parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, and you should avoid exposure to any gamma rays. They will mess you up. So light is a form of energy called electromagnetic radiation. And light, when it travels, travels as a wave, much like the waves you see at the beach. So waves are gonna come in all different sizes and colors. You can have long or short wavelengths. The wavelength is defined as the distance from peak to peak. So we see here that red light has a longer wavelength and purple light or violet light has a shorter wavelength. 
In both chemistry and physics, wavelength is represented by this term, lambda, which is a Greek symbol and looks like an upside-down Y. Frequency. Frequency is another property of a wave. All light waves travel at the same speed in a vacuum. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So when we measure a wave's frequency, we measure how many waves pass a given point in one second. Frequency is represented by this term, nu, which looks like a V with a tiny bit of a tail. Frequency has units of waves per second, or cycles per second, or you've maybe heard it called hertz. So what I want you to imagine is a wave traveling through a particular plane, and the distance the wavelengths are apart are what is going to give this different frequencies. So I'm going to stop a moment and give you a very silly demonstration that hopefully will help you relate frequency and wavelength. Here is a demonstration of how wavelength and frequency are related. I have here a beam of red light. And the wavelength, of course, is the distance from peak to peak. The frequency is the number of times the peak of a wave passes a particular point per second. So I'm going to use the plane held down there by Mr. Mole. We're going to look at this particular plane. And each time the peak of the red light passes through this plane, I'm going to say beep. So here is our light traveling in slow motion. Beep, beep, beep. Now let's try the same example in slow motion, but this time with purple light, which has a smaller wavelength or difference from peak to peak. So once again, I shall beep every time the peak of the wave passes the plane. Beep, beep. Beep, beep. Now which time did I beep faster? With the purple light or the red light? Well, the purple light, of course. So if we look at them together, you can see that the purple light had a greater frequency and a shorter wavelength than the red light, which had a longer wavelength. And if I were to pull these two together, you can see that I will beep, beep much faster for the purple light than I will for the red light. Now I would say this is the silliest demonstration I will do for you all semester, but I would be wrong. So this slide is just to remind you that when you have a longer wavelength, a greater distance between the peaks, you will have less waves per second pass a particular point and a lower frequency. If you have a shorter wavelength or higher frequency, you will have more peaks per second pass a particular plane and therefore a higher frequency. Now it turns out that the speed of light is actually equal to the wavelength multiplied by the frequency. So we represent the speed of light as C, and that in a vacuum is 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Lambda is, of course, the wavelength, and this is in units of meters. Nu is the frequency, and this is going to be in units of per second, or hertz. So if you know the wavelength, you know the frequency and vice versa, given that the speed of light is this set constant. So even in the math, you can see that wavelength and frequency are multiplied by one another, and that makes those inversely proportional. A long wavelength will give you a low frequency. A short wavelength will give you a high frequency. Now, meters is a decent length of measurement for radio waves, but many waves are much shorter in length. So often they're reported in this unit called nanometers. One meter is equal to 10 to the ninth nanometers.
So if we work the math relating frequency and wavelength, if we have red light, which has a wavelength of 700 nanometers, and if I divide by 10 to the 9th, I wind up with this value for the meters. If I rearrange this formula so that nu is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength, notice our meters cancel out, and our frequency is 4.3 times 10 to the 14th seconds. So when you're working this calculation and you get 10 to the 14th, don't be concerned that that's a large number. The frequency of light is extremely large. Let's compare this to a shorter wavelength, violet light, which is typically 400 nanometers. So dividing by 10 to the 9th gives me this value for meters. And when I divide that into the speed of light, you notice that my frequency is larger. So once again, a longer wavelength gives a lower frequency. A shorter wavelength gives a higher frequency. It turns out that the energy of a particle of light is directly proportional to the frequency of its wave. So energy is equal to some constant times frequency. That constant is represented as h. This is Planck's constant and it is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So when you multiply a joule second times a second to the minus one, you wind up with a unit of energy in joules. So to summarize this, I trust you already realize frequency and wavelength are inversely related, and the energy of light is directly related to frequency. So a large frequency means a large energy involved in that particular photon, whereas a small frequency means a small energy involved in that particular photon. So now hopefully you understand the diagram that I was showing you initially, where radio waves have low energy, long wavelength, and also low frequency, and gamma rays, which are quite dangerous, have high energy, high frequency, and a short wavelength. So here is a typical question to ask students. What is the frequency of a photon with a wavelength of 440 nanometers? Well, first off, we should remember that the speed of light is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. So if we want to know the frequency, we should take the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Now, the speed of light we know is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The wavelength is 440, and that is in nanometers. So you notice that we have meters on the top and nanometers on the bottom. We're going to have to do something to make sure that we have units canceling out. So I will remind you that on the bottom, perhaps you want to make sure that you have one meter is equal to one times 10 to the ninth nanometers. That should help you get your frequency. This next question asks, what is the energy of a photon with a wavelength of 440 nanometers? Well, we know that energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. I trust in the previous problem, you got the frequency. So you just need to go with energy is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, and that will be in units of joule seconds. And if you multiply this by the frequency, I think you'll get the correct answer. The value you're going to get is a very small number, but remember that's just for one photon. Photons don't typically travel in one. You have many of them. So in your homework, you're actually going to be asked for the energy associated with a mole of photons. 
this formula here will just give you the energy of one photon, but I trust you realize that if you want to get the energy of a mole of photons, you should simply multiply this by Avogadro's number, because you know how many items are in a mole. And I also remind you that this will ask for the answer in kilojoules. So remember that there are 1,000 joules in one kilojoule. But this is fine for this question. The rest is just helping you get ready for your homework.